Okay, so I would like to introduce our two speakers today. So we have Laura Abbott um, and Tanya Kappa. They are presenting Pregnancy in Prison Partnership International PIPPI, Building a Collaborative Global Network of Best Practice for and with Women Prisoners. Dr. Laura Abbott is an Associate Professor in Research and at the University of Her I'm going to get this wrong again. Herefordshire, oh, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay, a registered midwife and a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy and a fellow of the Royal College of Midwives. Laura's doctorate examined the experiences of pregnant women in prison, the incarcerated pregnancy, an ethnographic study of perinatal women in English prisons. Laura co-authored the Birth Charter for Pregnant Women in England and Wales, published by Birth Companions in May 2016. Laura has contributed to the review of Her Majesty's Prison and probation services operational policies for prison staffing, managing and caring for all women experiencing prisoners. I suppose I should technically say His Majesty now, shouldn't I? Mm -hmm. uh, more recently, Laura and the co-funded oh, Pregnancy in Prison Partnership International with academics in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the USA and the UK Wide Prisons Midwife Action Group. A current ESRC funded research in partnership with the charity Birth Companions and their lived experience team includes experiences of women and the professional staff involved with a criminal justice system being separated for their babies. Dr. Tanya Kappa is an experienced academic and midwife with over 25 years of international clinical midwifery experience. Tanya commenced her midwifery career in London, the UK, and has held a range of positions, including several clinical leadership roles within tertiary maternity services, a freestanding birth center and was the named midwife for a caseload of HIV positive women. Tanya migrated permanently to Australia, yay, in 2006 and has worked for CQU University Australia teaching into the midwifery program since 2015. Tanya is currently a senior lecturer and the head of course for the Bachelor of Midwifery graduate entry and is based in Queensland. So I'm going to hand it over to Laura first and I'm going to sit here in the background and enjoy. Lovely thanks so much Liz it's fantastic to be here and um, it's lovely to see so many people from around the world actually and that's really what Pippi is about so Tanya and I are here representing Pippi there's, a, there's I think there's 10 of us now um, in our Pregnancy in Prison International group. And the reason we, we wanted to come together was because we really want to find solutions and work together to um, give best practice to pregnant women in prison and new mothers in prison. There's a, there, there are issues um, around the world and so many similarities that we wanted to found um, Pippi. And we are, we've been going for about just over a nearly two years now um, and today we represent the whole of Pippi and we're going to be talking about pregnancy in prison and I will be starting and then I'll be handing over to Tanya who will be talking about um, more um, nuanced diet in prison so what I wanted to start with what we wanted to start with today was really to talk about what we already know about pregnancy in prison and this is pretty much all around the world we understand that many women who end up in the prison system are victims themselves they often have survived awful childhoods many have suffered sexual abuse in childhood many women around 50 percent of women in prison that we meet are also um, victims and survivors of domestic violence and unsurprisingly these women will go on to um, misuse substances such as drugs and alcohol. And we understand that around 80% of women in, in all of our prisons are suffering some form of mental illness. Um, and that is pretty global that, that we find. And the thing is, we also have found that many women will discover that they're pregnant on admission to prison. So it's something that women might find as a, as a, as a shock and surprise. What we don't really know and what we don't have numbers of particularly well globally is that the numbers of women pregnant women in prison and we think in the uk there are around 600 pregnant women in prison each year and around 100 babies born to, to women in prison and 
about 50% of those babies will stay with their mothers on a mother and baby unit, but then again, 50% will be separated and go into the community. Um, and so it, it's it's important to think of this in context of around the world because we do have differences um, in the numbers, but very similar characteristics in the types of women that will end up in the criminal justice system. So these are, um, I know Lizzie kindly mentioned that our, um, our birth charters. So there's a picture of, of the UK birth charter and that was developed in conjunction um, with women who are with women with lived experience who work with um, the charity Birth Companions in the UK and um, academics and um, midwives like myself, we co-authored the birth charter and this sets out best practice for um, pregnancy and new motherhood in prison. And one of the reasons that Tanya and I have got to know each other and become firm friends from, from across the time zones is that um, in Australia, uh, the, the birth charter was adapted and used for the women in Australian prisons having babies as well. So there's, if there's something that you want to find, if you want to find out more, we, I'm sure Tanya and I will be very happy to share any resources that, that you might like and might need and might be useful for women in, in countries that you're, you're um, working in as well. So my research, um, I, uh, to give a little bit of background, uh, my research was uh, undertaken in, started in 2012, it's for a doctorate um, in health research, and I wanted to look specifically at pregnancy in prison. There hadn't been very much done, especially from the women's perspectives themselves. A lot of the research that had been done had been for staff um, and staff opinions. So it was important to hear what women had to say themselves. Um, and I was able to uh, do some research in three different prisons in, in England. And I spent around 10 months uh, researching different prisons and, and really hanging around prisons. And it was a, an ethnographic study. So I really wanted to get the whole picture. So I was able to interview women and staff. So I interviewed 28 women for my research and 10 members of staff. And I was very fortunate that, that women were very willing and, and um, very kind in coming forward and very, very candid with their experiences. And, and what I found overall that the system really isn't designed with pregnant women in prison, with pregnant women in mind. I mean, when we think about prison, we don't tend to think about um, pregnancy. It doesn't tend to be the front and foremost of our, of our minds. So the system um, really, really isn't designed very well And when, when it comes to pregnancy. And what I found mainly was that all pregnant women because they're going in and out of prison more often than anyone else, any other prisoners, they, they go in and out for their scans, they go in and out for um, obstetric appointments. Most of the women that you meet in prison are high risk and they would feel intense shame. Um, just the fact that they were going into the hospital from prison, they would be flanked by two prison officers usually, they would be in chains, they'd be in handcuffs, they'd feel the gaze of the public on them and feel very um, ashamed of feeling um, being watched and judged. And bearing in mind the majority of women in our prisons are there for very short sentences for, for, for crimes that are non-violent, it's particularly difficult in, in those situations where women would want to sort of shout out, look, I'm not a murderer, I'm, I'm just in here because I, I'm for shoplifting or, or some more um, minor crime and, and would be feeling very, very ashamed. Women didn't get what they're entitled to in prison. So they're entitled to things like having a pregnancy pack um, for, for extra food. They might be in, entitled to have extra mattresses. And something I found particularly shocking, shocking um, was that women couldn't get breast pads. Now, it seems quite a simple thing to us, but when women have been separated from their babies, they're lactating, they've got leaky boobs and they're, they're, they're having wet patches on their, on their clothes. It was very humiliating and shaming for women. Um, I found that medication would be missed. Um, so for instance, uh, there's, a, there's a quote here on, on this um, slide saying my mum had a brain hemorrhage through high blood pressure so that's why I'm worried with my high blood pressure. They said I have to wait for confirmation from my doctor 
and these, this is an example of a woman who um, didn't have her medication. It just, um, it, it's not a seamless process, so it stopped. The woman came into prison, she had to get all her medication re-prescribed again, and we know how dangerous that is. So particularly women who might be on um, antidepressants or, or even antipsychotics, it would often take a little time to get them re-prescribed. And what I really found, and I will stand by this, it really isn't a safe place from a healthcare and a midwifery perspective. Um, you, there's a lot in the news at the moment about cell births, especially from the UK. There's a big inquest ongoing um, due to the shocking and terrible, tragic death of, of a baby um, inside one of our prisons. And, and um, we know that, you know, at night time, there's no midwifery care. Um, we know that women are locked in their cells, they often don't get their call bells answered. And I found in my research that women were giving birth in their cells. Um, and particularly shocking, one woman in my in my study gave birth to her breech baby 36 weeks, and she wasn't able to get to, to hospital in time, simply because nobody believed that she was in labour. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done and needs to change. But from a positive perspective, um, from a midwifery perspective, we can make a difference. Um, from my research, I was able to uh, get a lot of publicity, particularly um, surrounding cell births, and um, it caught the eye of politicians and and made changes um, happen in policy. Um, it doesn't go far enough, in my my opinion. Um, we need to go further. Uh, myself and birth companions and others gave evidence for our UK Joint Human Rights Committee, and that's a parliamentary committee. And it's um, particularly focused upon the cell births and women giving birth in cells and the unsafe um, practice of um, what the unsafe practice that's going on inside of our prisons. So it's important that we carry on and, and use our voice as midwives to make changes happen. And that's one of the reasons why PIPI exists. We are a really strong global collaboration, um, countries around the world. And I think we have a really strong voice and we're pretty much um, in, in we, we're quite embryonic in a way. Um, we, we haven't been going very, very long, but we really are very passionate about making change happen for um, pregnant women in prison around the world and, and setting sort of a, a very strong, powerful voice for change. And here's some more pictures. Um, we did have films, but we weren't able to, to share these with you. But if anyone ever wants any more resources from us, we, we're very happy to share. These are just pictures from um, Houses of Parliament um, giving evidence for our um, Joint Human Rights Committee. And this was um, this was all actioned and taken forward in and eventually policy has changed and it's again it's quite slow um but policy is changing it's it's we do now have far more um specialist midwives in our prisons we also have um specialist prison officers who who've had special training to support um pregnant women in prison um however i still feel we we haven't gone far enough and we still have a long way to go to make sure all the changes are actioned on the ground. And then one, one big issue that came from my research and I know has come from others research around the world and something that's important to all of us is food and food in prisons is particularly, gets um, a particularly bad name as you can imagine, not much is spent on food. But if you're pregnant, um, the timeliness of food is really particularly awful if you're feeling sick or nauseous or you have heartburn. Um, and nearly all the women I spoke to in prison would talk about food and how they felt either hungry or thirsty because of the water coming out the same taps that they were using to wash their hands in the in their cells. Um, also, the the types of the quality of food. This was a particular issue for women, um, and and the fact that they would have to eat at, at times of the day that the prison dictated, which doesn't work very well for pregnancy. And this is a quote. Um, 
from from one of the one of the women that um spoke to me and she said it's disgusting she said ham is like spam but a cheaper version like the packets of dog food it's disgusting it's vile you get boiled burgers and half the food is never cooked properly i'm surprised the whole jail hasn't got her food poisoning i don't eat meat here it's not meat it's horrific it's disgusting i wouldn't feed it to my dog it's really bad and that is a, an example and so many women would say similar things um about the food and what i'd love to do now is hand over to the lovely tanya um who is going to talk about our next steps and what we've been doing with regards to our scoping review of the literature so i will mute myself now tanya and i hope i'm keeping to the right time um but it's lovely to hand over <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Um, yes, yeah, so I um, am going to talk to you now about some work we've been doing as part of the Pippi group. Um, when we first got together, we all brainstormed and sat around and talked about what we thought was really, I guess, worthy of our, our focus initially. And one of the um, main themes, as Laura has just talked about, was around the diet um, provided to women in prison who are pregnant or, or new mothers. So we decided that we would undertake a scoping review of the literature to, I guess, better understand you know, what is known about the diet that is provided for women in prison who are pregnant or, or new parents. Um, and we, it was a bit of a, a large pro, um, project because there was a great deal of literature around, but very little of it specifically focused on diet and um, the the food um, policies, etc. So I will now talk through what we actually discovered. So our overarching review question was, is the diet offered to pregnant women in prison adequate? So just to provide, I guess, a bit of background, um, we know that globally, the number of women who are in, who are in prison and are pregnant is increasing. But little is really understood about whether their additional dietary needs are being considered or met when they are in prison. So I guess the other thing, as Laura mentioned earlier on, that we need to also bear in mind is that a lot of women that do enter prison who are pregnant will have complex health and social um, backgrounds. And interestingly, being incarcerated actually provides an opportunity for them um, to have health interventions and to actually have their, their nutritional needs met during pregnancy. So whilst everywhere we look, there is lots of information about what um, pregnant women should and shouldn't eat, um, what we didn't really fully understand at that point was how those needs were being met in prison. So we undertook a review of the literature and I've just provided a, a quick summary here of the findings. Um, we have actually submitted this, this paper for publication, so we will share it once it's published, which obviously will contain a lot more information about the methods. But in summary, we had a total of 16 papers that met the inclusion criteria for um, the review. Just to provide you with a, um, a bit of an idea of, of where the papers um, came from, we had six from the USA, four from the UK, three from Iran, two from Canada, and one were for, was from Australia. Most of them, um, or half, I should say, five were literature reviews, five were qualitative studies, and then there were a couple of um, mixed methods, quantitative studies, two were policy analyses, one was a uh, multi-component consultant, consultancy paper, and one was a report. So what we did, we extracted the relevant data and we thematically analysed that. We actually identified two main themes. The first we called an inconsistent reality and the second we called influencing the appeal of food. So the first theme, um, an inconsistent reality, really, I guess, represented the clear disconnect between rhetoric and what was actually happening, the reality of what was actually happening in the prison. So whilst the majority of the 16 papers clearly acknowledged that the women did have additional nutritional requirements, um, and they were often documented and were very broadly based upon the government, the local government dietary guidelines, but 
the way in which those policies and guidelines were actually being translated into the correctional setting was, was really rather inconsistent. And this was something we identified that there was a clear need for some consistency around policy development and the way in which they are implemented across the various correctional settings. So, for example, some of the papers that we identified talked about prisons that did absolutely have um, policies in place. Some of them were very, very comprehensive, but they were inconsistently followed. And some prisons had absolutely no policies whatsoever. Another thing that became apparent was that there was a number of additional factors that really influenced um, the prison services ability to provide the healthy and nutritious food. So often food wasn't seen as a priority, um, particularly when prisons were facing you know, financial cuts and budgetary constraints. And of course, the, the rising costs of food were, were having significant issues too, it impacts too. Um, there was still a real focus on the simple need to feed a very large population and each person was allocated a per head um, costing for, for meals and that did not actually increase for women that were pregnant or, or breastfeeding. And it became clear that the cost of ingredients played um, a really important role in the type of food and the amount of food that was available for pregnant women. One um, really interesting finding was that uh, a study spoke about prison officers who were interviewed about their beliefs around diet for pregnant women. And a significant portion of the prison officers didn't believe that women who were pregnant should be given any additional foods or different foods to the greater prison population. There were some prisons that routinely provided pregnant women with additional food or snacks, or they were given um, a specific pregnancy pack or vouchers, which they could then use to buy up more food. But often the foods that were available for them to buy up um, weren't particularly healthy and they were often high in sugar and, and carbs and that type of thing. So um, that, that often was a bit of a deterrent for some of the women. Um, and in some studies, there were no additional offerings whatsoever for, for women. There was no opportunity to, to buy up food or even to earn money to buy up food because they weren't allowed to work in the prison once they were pregnant. And as Laura mentioned, we also had um, some quite a few things around the quality of the food being stodgy, um, either really overcooked and rubbery or undercooked and raw and the, you know, the chickens and the, and the and various meats were actually um, cold inside and that put the women off eating those foods. Um, There's quite a lot of talk in the papers about um, supplements with you know, vitamins and that was seen as a bit of a sort of one size fits all uh, remedy I guess. They felt that if they gave the women a vitamin tablet they wouldn't need to worry about what they ate so that was that was quite a common finding across the um, papers. Interestingly women who had specific dietary needs whether that was for medical reasons, religious reasons, um, they generally weren't catered for and women who had um, side effects from you know, pregnancy, nausea, vomiting, um, you know pica or um, indigestion that they were simply not catered for. So if a woman was, you know, feeling nauseous and had vomited, she wasn't then given any further meals, which was um, interesting. The other um, theme that popped up um, was around access to fluids as well. So we know that women um, during pregnancy need to have, you know, a, a plenty of oral um, intake, but that was limited. And as Laura said, often the, the water wasn't appealing because it was coming from crusty taps or it was warm or discolored. Now, the second theme um, was called influencing the appeal of food. So this actually related to the way in which, I guess, being incarcerated removed the women's autonomy around what they chose to eat, the quality of the food they ate, how much food they ate and how they could access snacks um, and, and water and, and milk and so on. And of course, where they were actually able to eat. And of course, this in turn then influenced the appeal and the social aspect of eating and drinking were often um, diminished. So those, interestingly, again, as Laura mentioned, those who um, make up a lot of the pregnant um, population are 
women who may lack some degree of food literacy um, and they may have some distorted views around what is considered a healthy diet. Um, so for example, you know, fresh fruit and vegetables and, and healthy protein sources weren't often part of those women's um, pre-prison diet. What came out um, of that really was that a lot of women actually ate a lot better when they were incarcerated than when they were actually on the outside. So women who were um, serving longer sentences often had um, much better nutritional health um, during their pregnancy. So the other thing that popped up a lot was around how important it is to provide women with education around what they should and shouldn't be eating. But of course, given what we know about the, the lack of autonomy, the lack of choices, the women, you know, despite being told, oh, you shouldn't eat sugar and you shouldn't eat too much of this and that, they weren't actually able to obviously visualize the packaging for the foods they were being served. So they felt, I guess, a sense of frustration that the, the um, information was being shared, but they couldn't actually act upon that. And the women spoke of being being fed rather than being nourished when they ate their meals. A lot of women who um, found the meals particularly unappealing, they would find it was repetitive every other day, they were having the same thing. They were being told when they could eat and when they couldn't eat. And they often felt hungry and some even lost significant amounts of weight. So as I mentioned earlier on, there were concerns around the safety of food because it was often undercooked or overcooked. Um, and this generally meant that they were hungry because they didn't eat. And then the lack of um, consistent access to snacks and drinks actually had a further knock on effect for them. Um, as Laura also said, the environment where they were eating was, was also a challenge. So they would be given um, a meal time that was you're very restricted there wasn't a great time um you know opportunity to sort of sit and enjoy the food it had to be eaten very quickly so they could return to their cell or what they were doing but interestingly some of the women felt that they also um were, were turned off the food because they were eating next to their toilet in their room and of course that that had a negative impact on their um appetite so the next slide is so what so we we thought a bit about how the findings of our review um are important for practice i guess going forward and the things that we need to consider as as midwives and as care um, providers for women who are incarcerated during pregnancy so we we know that women in prison do often have a range of complex health and social needs and therefore the opportunity we have as, as um, midwives or maternity care providers when women are incarcerated to provide them with um, you know, a good, balanced, healthy diet um, and education support is an opportunity that we absolutely should be um, seizing. Um, and as I mentioned earlier on, it is known that when um, a woman is serving a longer sentence, often um, her, her uh, nutritional status is much better, which has a knock-on effect for um, maternal and newborn outcomes. It improves those. Um, and we must harness the opportunities that we have when women are in prison and are pregnant, because we know that pregnancy is a time when a lot of women are most receptive to you know, education support and, and are most likely to make significant changes. And of course, last but not least, we have to, um, I guess, be aware of our important role that we play as advocates for women. Um, and, and we really need to work towards, as we are as a um, group, as the PIPI group are doing, um, improving and, I guess, I don't guess standardising isn't quite the word, but ensuring that prisons globally, regardless of their geographical location, are you know, having policies in place and are actually adhering to them when they are providing diet to pregnant women in prison. Now, the next couple of slides, Laura, there are references, aren't they, which um, they're rather wordy slides, but they are um, available, I understand, after if you want to look up the 16 papers that fell into our inclusion criteria are just there. And that's it from us, Liz. 
excellent and yes you people once the video goes up onto youtube and facebook they'll be able to watch and stop and um explore and copy down the links as well it's an area that we don't necessarily think about being an area for midwives to work in when you think about the pregnant because it's not a place that we quite often have students going to it's not a place that is spoken about it's one of those areas that is kind of not intentionally hush hush but i suppose it is um but when you look at the prison populations and you look at the women and the socioeconomic situations and the mental health issues that are involved it's an area that we definitely need to be involved in okay so if we've got any questions from the audience so celine has said what about childbirth time um yeah that's a really good question I'm, I'm also looking at um other comments in the in the chat as well from margaret for example saying how important it is about prison authorities understanding i totally agree um and when it comes to when it comes to birth um it's it's like any other woman um except home is not home um home is a prison cell so when women go into labor in in prison they need to um go to and this is in the uk and, and australia and, and the usa this is this is what's happening the, the, the women need to go and be transferred out into um the local hospital the problem that we have is we have gatekeepers and we have barriers so it's not as straightforward as just um, opening your front door and, and getting a taxi, getting on the bus or getting in a car, you have to go through um, security checks. Um, and and one, of the, one of the things that has been quite a big issue and one of the reasons why one in 10 women in the UK are giving birth in their prison cells is they're not being gotten out in time. Um, often that might be that, 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 that somebody's not necessarily believing that a woman is in labour. Um, that if you haven't got a midwife there, you've got people making decisions about women's um, women's labour without having the special skills that we have. So it's it's very complicated, um, and it, it's why we're campaigning to end sentencing of pregnant women in prison in in the UK at the moment. Um, but you know what you what in an ideal world, what happens is a woman um, goes into labour and she is transferred usually um with a prison officer with her and into the local uh, into the local hospital where she um labors and, and gives birth in a local hospital there um she may or may not have a supporter with her um it very much depends on on the situation that she's in but often she's left without a supporter we have birth companions in the uk where we may go and and, and give her um support um but but yes it's it's quite complex and quite complicated um i'm seeing margaret saying are they still um shackled no they should not be shackled no woman should be shackled in labor um it doesn't happen very often anymore but we still do hear of cases where a woman may be and and maybe in the postnatal period as well um she should not be transferred in labor in handcuffs um that is mandatory policy now that she shouldn't be um yeah celine's talking about human rights absolutely um and and that is why we took it to the human rights committee um so yes there's there's so much that needs to be done and and it, it's it's great for us to have a global presence um uh, and also you know anyone that's wanting to join with us and to and to sort of support and campaign with us is fantastic too i don't know if you had anything to say tanya i'll get off my soapbox i'm always on it <laughs> so i'll get off for a minute no no laura that that's fantastic um i'm just reading bridget's um comment there fantastic presentation thank you for that yes um bridget's another one of our pippi team members right. it's quite yeah, often think... it's not until conference presentations that things that we should have thought about suddenly get put into our face and into our view and it's like i never thought of that before and now it's something like yeah we should be thinking about it so we do need passionate people like yourself and your team who do bring this to the forefront to make us think 
and to make us remember that there are women who are disadvantaged that we need to be caring for both in prison but also when they get out as well and their experiences if they're birthed or being pregnant in prison are going to affect subsequent um, pregnancy journeys and birthing journeys in the in the future yeah and um Celine's asking me about midwifery care um yes um it, we do have um midwives in our prisons and we do have specialist midwives and i think at, at the beginning i've talked about in the uk we have a prison midwives action group where we have prison midwives who come together and share best practice and also experiences and support each other um because it's quite a difficult job working in a silo um and often sort of quite disjointed from the rest of the healthcare team in prison. So um, yeah, we do have it. Again, we don't have specialist midwives in all of our prisons and that's what we need. Um, you know, wherever women are giving birth, we need midwives. So um, yes, I, we, we, we're still arguing for that. And, and until recently, the word midwife didn't even exist in any of our policies here in the UK. So we're doing a lot to change that as well. So needing to make sure that we have a much stronger midwifery voice and presence in our prisons and for them to know that we are not going away, <laughs> which is really important. And we're not. <laughs> so. Tanya, do you want to say anything? I was just going to say, Laura, I think we're probably a little bit behind the UK here in Australia. We, we don't have specific um, prison midwives as such. Um, generally, women that are transferred to the local hospital and are provided with care um, from the midwives there. But um, what we have been doing at, at CQ University, where I work with, with my colleague Bridget, we've actually been linking our midwifery students with incarcerated women and they have been um, following their journey as a continuity of care experience as part of their midwifery education program and it has been a purely supportive relationship so the students don't access the woman's you know correctional background it is purely there they're there as a support person to provide them with the, you know the, the i guess that relationship and that feeling of safety um, during their pregnancy they see them at least four times they will ideally go to the hospital with them when they birth and then they will see them twice postnatally. So we are, I guess, trying to change things and we are trying to prepare the midwives of the future for this role. Um, but at the moment, we are absolutely a little bit behind you, Laura, um, and we don't have, have that specialist position. And I know that in um, one of your partners in this project is Annette Briley who's the professor yes. of midwifery that I have the joy of working with under, depending which way you want to look at it. Um, <laughs> and we have got midwifery students actually going out on Monday to the second, yeah. um, our second lot of go students going out onto a place, but actually the third lot going to the to the prison. So they're looking forward to it from the, the women's health, the primary health care, the mental, perinatal mental health. They're looking at it from that broader concept because um, when the students went there last time, there were no pregnant women there, but they got a chance to look at what else they do and how they kind of prepare mm -hmm. and have a talk to it. So it is great. Now, we had a question about have you published anything along your journey so far? Where can they find it? Uh, we, well, well, Laura has published lots and lots of work from her PhD and, and since then, haven't you, Laura? Did you want to talk about what you've been Publishing first. Yeah, I mean we're writing together as Pippi, um, and as, as Tanya said, our our diet paper is currently under review, and we have lots and lots up our sleeve, um, lots of work to be getting on with. Um, but yes, if I mean I've I have written, and so is Tanya. You've you've got lots of publications as well. So I think um, it's quite. I think the best thing to. I mean, there's there's um, on this slide. There's a lot of references. So if you want to have a look at that. But if you if you look up on Google Scholar any either of our names, either Tanya's name or my name or any of the Pippi group actually at the front of the slide, you'll find um, lots and lots of work on um, pregnancy in prison. My latest paper is on midwifery care in English prisons. So you might find that particularly useful. Um, that's quite current. That's just been published this year in birth. Um, I've got a couple more under review at the moment. Um, but yes, I think, you know, it, it's like having a voice in our academic journals, but also, you know, presenting and also with our governments and just keeping keeping on that way. But the publications are quite 
quite useful to, to really see what the evidence is. So if you if you look up our names, you will definitely find them there. Um, but also email either of us or any of the PIPI group. We, you know, this is we 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 love talking about this. We love actioning anything. Um, so if you want to get in contact, please do. Um, and we'll be really happy to share anything, any resources, anything with you. So do do contact us as well. Um, I'm just happy going to it. plug our Twitter page as well, Laura. Yes. We have so a Twitter we... page, don't we? Our PPE page, which um, you can contact us via that too. Yes. That's, I think <laughs> it's got a slide link. I think we had it on the... the, the... Yeah, it's PPE. Yeah, one. put that on your last slide. Yeah, on the first slide, we've got our contacts. 